Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Idza Kalu. Welcome to today's uh, CME session. Uh, today, we are going to have a discussion that will be uh, multidisciplinary, so to speak. We are going to be delving into matters retina with uh, oculoplasty. With me, we are going to have Dr. Moshai Gashago as uh, one of our speakers. He's a vitreo retinal surgeon at CTI Hospital. And also we're going to have uh, Dr. Joseph Washira, an oculoplastic surgeon at Kenyatta National Hospital and uh, Nairobi Eye Associates. Um, so I hope you're all uh, welcome and ready to learn as we learn about uh, choroidal melanoma case uh, presentation and discussion. If you have any questions, kindly put them in the chat and then there will be um, a response to them at the end of the presentation. Um, and if you have any comment or addition, you could raise the hand, raise your hand or yeah, the that icon is, that, is, that uh, during the, so uh, the session can give you an opportunity. Kindly, as you join, use your microphones so that we just have the speaker um, only. And uh, Evans, kindly mute your microphone. Uh, Dr. Mushai, uh, I would like to welcome you to start us off and uh, also Dr. Washira, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kalu. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here at the OSK webinar and presenting this rather interesting case. Uh, let me put up my slides. Here we are. Share. Good. All right. So uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, today, Dr. Washira and I are pleased to present a case we co-managed. And the title today is, uh, the, retina, the talk today is titled Retina Meets Oculoplasty, the case of choroidal melanoma. And we'll discuss a case that uh, actually originated from the hands of oculoplasty, came to retina, and ended up back at uh, oculoplasty. Ah. Um, so as an introduction, um, I'll go through the case presentation. I'll present what we did as part of the retina team. Then Dr. Washira, um, my very able, very able uh, co-presenter will present what he did on the plastic front of things. And then we'll have a short, short discussion, um, find out what is your take hospital message uh, because I'm not sure this message taken home will do much for you. And then uh, we'll take it from there. So um, our patient uh, was DG, 24-year-old male, and he presented as a referral uh, from an oculoplastic surgeon on the 16th of March, 2021, with a diagnosis of right eye retinal scars, a query proliferative vitroretinopathy, PVR, and he came six days later, and he gave complaints of poor vision in the right eye for a duration of four months. On examination, um, the left eye was essentially normal. So we'll just focus largely on the right eye. His visual acuity was 618, not improving beyond that with a pinhole, and intraocular pressure was 13 millimeters of mercury. Um, on slit lamp and indirect ophthalmoscope examination, the leads were normal, conjunctiva, cornea, anterior chamber were normal. He had a grade one relative afferent pupillary defect. The lens was clear, optic disc was about 0.3, and the fundus uh, was as shown. This is my beautiful fundus drawing. I encourage residents uh, to do better than me, but uh, it captures the essence of what was going on in this eye. So this was on the 22nd of March when he presented, and indeed the patient had an inferior retinal detachment, and nasally there was that area of possible PVR. There was some scarring, there was a slight hemorrhage that could be seen, but predominantly was the retinal detachment. So we made a diagnosis of right eye retinal detachment, and we queried was there some inflammatory reaction because of the PVR and the scarring, and so fashioned our treatment according to that. 
So in terms of investigations, we requested a full blood count in ESR. White cell count was essentially normal. HB was at 15.8, platelets were normal at 299. ESR was 14, not remarkable. We did a VDRL as part of the posterior uveitis screen and it was negative. HIV test was negative. And we requested a quantiferon TB gold to investigate for TB and a chest X-ray. And this, as of this time, had uh, not been done. So we started the patient on steroids, having seen this because of that possible inflammatory reaction. But that nasal corner of the eye, there wasn't you know, any clarity as to whether there was a break or it was just a reaction, whether there were membranes, uh, you know, whether it was inflammatory. So we put the patient on steroids as we awaited theater. Uh, so we put him on uh, prednisone, 60 milligrams, to taper down to 40 after a week, and omeprazole, then booked for a possible vitrectomy, band, and oil, um, but planned to do a fundoscopy preoperatively uh, because, you know, if it's largely inflammatory, you'll find a lot of change before then. So on the date of surgery, we did a fundoscopy and sure enough, we noted a significant reduction in the subretinal fluid. And, and as this fluid now was reduced, we could actually see that there was a mass nasally. It appeared kind of brownish with a small associated hemorrhage on it. And there are a few retinal folds uh, due to the reduced um, subretinal fluid. There was still a retinal detachment, but was not as massive as before. So now we had different differentials here. We thought of possible granuloma or tuberculoma or melanoma uh, or possibly other tumors. And these are our differentials considering that this was a 24 year old male patient with what appeared to be some inflammatory reaction associated with his retinal detachment. So the surgery was canceled as this now was established to be a medical um, retinal detachment. And we advised ocular ultrasound and a quantiferon TB goal, which up to this point had still not been done. So the quantiferon test came out a couple of days later, usually it takes about two weeks before you get the results. And indeed, we had a positive quantiferon TB gold test result. The ocular ultrasound was still not done. So this was still pending. Um, so given the positive TB result, the inflammatory reaction in the eye, the brown mass nasally with some you know, associated retinal fluid, the patient was actually started on anti-TB treatment. The patient was reviewed a week later and a month later and the retinal detachment resolved on steroids that had initially been started off and TB treatment. And as you can see here, the fundus photo, the retinal detachment is gone, minimal retinal folds in there and small brown mass nasally. So at this point, the patient felt that he was doing well and was lost to follow up, having just started off on his anti-TB treatment. So for six months until November, I did not see him again. However, when he returned six months later, he reported that he had been compliant on his anti-TB treatment and was actually on the seventh month of treatment. For intraocular TB, you could treat it for six months. Some people prefer to consider it as part of neurotuberculosis and treat it for up to nine months. So he was on month seven of TB treatment. However, on examination, we noted that now there was a large hyperpigmented mass nasally that was uh, brown to dark, and at this point in time, we realized that that initial reaction to TB treatment was just something temporary, possibly as a response to the steroids. And a differential diagnosis of melanoma was made. And this time, the, actual, the ocular ultrasound got done. And as you can see, we had your typical textbook appearance of this tumor nasally. It was a collar stud shaped mass nasally, high reflectivity pattern with diminishing internal reflectivity and a diagnosis of right eye choroidal melanoma was made. And you can see here on the closer picture, uh, the right eye, you can see the nice color stud shape mass there and the over superimposed A scan here, an initial high spike, which goes with diminishing reflectivity and then hits up at again 100% when it hits the back of the eye. So at this point in time, I realized we're dealing with melanoma and quickly referred to Dr. Washira who will now take over the presentation from here. Dr. Ashira, over to you. All right, uh, good evening, uh, colleagues. Uh, allow me to share my screen.
Okay, I think there we are. So I received uh, this patient as a referral from Dr. Mushai, and uh, he came and uh, presented on the 9th of November, that is 2021. He, on examination, had a right uh, nasal retinal mass that was dark in color, actually gray to, to black in color. And uh, it was raised, uh, dome-shaped. And from that point on, I then got in touch again with Dr. Mushai and we concluded that given the relatively good vision that we needed to investigate further and uh, actually determine that what we were dealing with needed uh, urgent intervention. So we requested for a CT head and it basically showed uh, an ill-defined but enhancing mass. Uh, which measured 15 by 11 millimeters in the nasal retina of significance is that there was no uh, extra ocular spread, there was no orbital involvement, and neither were there intracranial mets. Uh, we also requested for a CT scan chest and abdomen, and these were reported as normal. Again, no liver or lung pathology noted. Consequent to that, we embarked on a bit of counseling because given the size of the tumor, our intervention modalities were actually limited and we counseled on enucleation. This is a 24 year old, uh, otherwise healthy uh, young man, strapping, uh, in good health and uh, well, given the, the decision to enucleate, he requested that we give him an opportunity to, to talk to his mother. And uh, this, this we did. And we got uh, self and parental consent and went ahead with the surgery on the 20th of uh, December uh, last year. And now, histology came back about uh, three weeks later. And uh, on gross, what was seen was a dark black tumor, which was now 15 millimeters across. So on both dimensions, and it was reported as a choroidal malignant melanoma. Scleral invasion was noted, but it was not a through and through invasion. I was not able to get the particular slides from the pathologist, and um, I regret that. However, what I have here is basically just textbook uh, slides showing the features that we're talking about uh, in terms of the histology and the cell type. Most common would be the spindle-shaped cells, so spindle A and spindle B, which have now basically been classified together. Uh, and then you see there is also the epithelioid cell type. This is the more aggressive uh, uh, cell type and is what is mostly associated with uh, choroidal melanomas. Then there are other manifestations which are basically necrotic and the mixed cell type, both of which are equally as uh, poor in terms of uh, your once prognosis. Where it's uh, basically uh, an indicator that there is going to be a higher likelihood of metastasis. Subsequent to or following the enucleation, this is about three weeks down the line, radiotherapy uh, was advised and uh, he was planned to receive 50 grays of uh, radiotherapy in 25 sessions over five weeks. And he's currently midway through. This is just um, an, an, an axial uh, scan showing the, the planning that the radio oncologists uh, considered when he planned the dosage to deliver. You can see there's an orbital implant. And basically the idea here is to apply 
100% of the intended dose in this uh, area with the blue marked area indicating that the intention is to 5% of the required dose. So just a few points of note before we get into our discussion is that this is a very rare tumor. And in white below 30 years of age, the incidence is about one case per million population. In blacks, the estimated uh, incidence would be about 15 to 50 times less. Some literature actually states that it's about 200 times less uh, than this. And what is also well known is that choroidal melanoma will more likely metastasize as opposed to iris melanoma. And nucleation is indicated for large tumors. So these are tumors above 15 millimeters and mostly in terms of height. Uh, in painful blind eyes and in eyes that indicate a probability of optic disc invasion. We'll probably also discuss a little bit more on, on some of these indications. Uh, there are various modalities of treatment one could choose to observe. So especially in small flat lesions that are probably less than about two to three millimeters in height and where one is not certain of the diagnosis, observation has been advocated in some quarters. Of course, if it is observed to be increasing in size, it is also uh, dangerous to wait too long because the larger the choroidal melanoma, the worse the prognosis. Genetic studies have been done, and uh, the aim of genetic studies here is to prognosticate likelihood of metastasis and death. Though these genetic studies are more or less done on the histological sample. So one would have to have intervened in one way or the other. Uh, plaque radiotherapy is also a viable intervention. We don't have it locally. When I discussed with the radio oncologists who attended this case, it would appear what they have is plaques that can be placed more anteriorly on the eye. And in this case, one would probably need something more posterior, uh, exactly overlying the, the area where this melanoma is. And then of course, external beam radiation. So that's the end of my presentation. I didn't have many slides. Mine was basically just to enucleate and uh, cross my fingers that the diagnosis is correct and we don't burn. Otherwise, I appreciate uh, Dr. Mushai uh, Dr. Anderito, the radio oncologist, uh, all members of COEXA, and I believe we can now uh, open the discussion. Um, I see on the chat we have uh, some questions, though, and also um, uh, Dr. Gashago has answered on the chat to Dr. Kimani's. Uh, a uh, question on vision improvement uh, when the patient was an, on anti-TB, so that the vision improved. Dr. Munira has a question and she also had a hand up. So let's see if we can answer the chat question and see if she still has another question that she would like to put forward um, verbally. So the question is considering the good vision, could an alternative to enucleation like plaque brachytherapy have been used. And I think Dr. Uh, Washira was uh, answering that at the end of the presentation. Um, not seeing any other questions. Um, hi, so I think also to answer beyond on what uh, Dr. Washira said about the plaques in terms of fine, they might not be available locally, but we had also managed another patient, uh, this time an elderly, you know, white man, the kind of, you know, the statistic for melanoma, white, white man living in 
sub-Saharan Africa, loves the outdoors, and uh, was previously and had been previously diagnosed as angle closure glaucoma. But when we examined him, realized there was actually a ciliary body mass, which was a melanoma pushing the iris diaphragm forward. And he had a similar mass, almost about maybe 10 to 15 millimeters base, I can't remember. And his vision was also pretty decent and he opted for brachytherapy. Uh, and you know he went, got it in the UK. So he was there for six months, got plaque treatment. Of course, it caused a lot of inflammation. Uh, vision was much worse by the time he was done with the plaque radiotherapy. And when he came, did the B scan and it was actually bigger than what it was before he went and eventually had to get in creation. Uh, so I think there's times when you need to make a swift and quick decision and decide if you are going to preserve vision or life. And, you know, looking at the statistics like for Africans in as much as the, you know, melanomas are much less common in the African population, at diagnosis they often to be a bit bigger because it's not on the top of your differential diagnosis. And therefore they tend to present at that range of base of 13 to 15 millimeters. So a lot of the times you find you're already dealing with a large mass threatening to you know, go through the ciliary body or you know, through the sclera or having ciliary body invasion that has high risk for metastasis. And you're called to do kind of, you know, to make a quick decision on whether to enucleate or not, yeah. Uh, Dr. Terry, there is also a question uh, about the ultrasound. From your presentation, the ultrasound was ordered quite early, but why was it uh, never done as early as it was ordered? Was there a particular reason? Yeah, I, I am not sure because we, we kept ordering one and whenever we asked, he said he'd do it, he'd do it. But it just wasn't getting done. Uh, even the TB test, you could see we ordered it from day one. And there was this kind of postponement, especially once we went to theater. I'll tell you, I have never seen someone sprint out of theater as fast as this young man, because <laughs> we had initially decided, okay, let's have vitrectomy as an option, but we'll review. So he had actually come to theater because I was in theater that day and I did the fundoscopy there. And when I told him this, the RD is gone, this is now a medical thing, let's do the quantiferon and ultrasound this guy ran out like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> so um, I think in that joy, he kind of neglected to do the tests we were requesting to do with much urgency. And it's when now after six, seven months of TB treatment, because you see, he was lost to follow up. I didn't see him even once. He came on the seventh month of TB treatment because his vision had improved. He was initially about 618, now was 612. He knows his retina has, read it, has kind of reattached and he disappeared for the entire time. And when he came, this mass had grown. And at that time, I basically you know, just walked into the ultrasound room and we did it and it was kind of very typical what we found. Okay. Um, Probably just to uh, comment a little further. Yes. In terms of, so what is it that we are looking forward to as far as this young man is concerned? Uh, definitely he will need a regular follow-up for the next uh, one year or so. He completes radiotherapy probably in about two weeks. And, uh, and thereafter, maybe about two, three months down the line, we'll need repeat scanning just to confirm um, the, you know, the, 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 the absence of uh, any additional tumors or metastasis. Uh, see, the thing here is that with a tumor this size, uh, in about 50% of patients, there will be some sort of metastasis sometime down the line. So he he actually is um, a, a patient who probably I would say is lucky that we managed to get to remove that eye that time we did, because remember there was already some scleral invasion. And so what he's getting in terms of radiotherapy is just to ensure that um, really no small cells escaped into the orbit. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Marco asked what is the sensitivity of the TB quantiferon test because he tested positive and the TB uh, treatment was started and there was also an improvement, though uh, we are not sure if all the improvement was from the, um, the, pre the steroids or also the TB anti TB was giving us uh, an 
a reaction or an action to it. Dr. Musha, you are yeah. muted. <laughs> yeah, so, well, the quantifier TB test is, is, is quite sensitive in cases of TB. So you'll find in cases of TB, it, depending on where you check, it might be anything from 85 to about 95% sensitivity. So it's quite sensitive. But the thing is, it, it is also positive in a couple of other tests that you might find. Eh? So you might find it positive in cases where you have lymphoproliferative disorders. So some cases you'll find lymphoma, you get a positive quantiferon TB test. So such a case where a patient had a ret invasion of the retina from lymphoma and quantiferon TB was positive and was also started on TB treatment. Only later on, on PET scanning, when you realize that this, this really looked more like lymphoma than anything, that the patient was found to have lymphoma from a lymph node that was biopsied. Eh? Also, sarcoidosis will occasionally give you a positive quantiferon TB goal test. So you have to be a bit careful. So it could rule in TB, but doesn't necessarily rule out other things. And I think that's part of the take home message. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it might rule in TB, but not rule out other things, exactly. Uh, Dr. Ashira, anything to add? Uh, I'll probably just answer a question I see on the chat here on CT versus MRI. Mm -hmm. and, um, really, e either of them will give you um, a suspicion to make your diagnosis. So with a with a CT scan, you have this um, enhancing lesion, and uh, with the MRI, you you have uh, a lesion that on on T1 is bright, and uh, on T2 is dark. So that's the opposite of what the vitreous appears on MRI. So if you have this and you're already having a a suspicion that you're dealing with an with a malignant melanoma or choroidal melanoma, and then it more or less uh, uh, guides you in towards making your diagnosis. So the other difference would be in terms of costs, because here you see you you also have to to do CT or MRI of the chest and abdomen. So the cost is a is an important factor. Okay, um, Dr. Ashok was uh, commenting that uh, there's plaque brachytherapy in uh, Cape Town. So perhaps that's for uh, good to know in case uh, later on we get a similar patient who'd sent to Cape Town if they uh, I can just add there that okay. it is available at the group to school hospital. Okay. The resident of Kenya went, went for treatment and came back. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ashok. Um, it's good to, to, to know that in, in terms of the size of the lesion, it's also important uh, because with, uh, with plaque brachytherapy, remember you, you have this uh, uh, ionizing or you know, these pellets that are within the plaque and they release radiation up to a certain depth. So, if you have a high tumor like what we had 15 millimeters off from the base of the retina or from the sclera, then you don't have your radiation getting to irradiate the entire body of the tumor. So what would go for plaque would be something less than uh, probably around 10 millimeters, uh, 10 millimeters and less. But it's good to know that they, we have options. Other options for smaller lesions, Two millimeters, three millimeters would be uh, laser or thermotherapy. Uh, maybe Dr. Mushai can comment on that. If you have small lesions, would this uh, serve well? Well, I, I, I don't have any experience with uh, small lesions uh, in terms of melanoma. The ones I have seen are uniformly large. Um, so I, I haven't tried it. I know there was the, what's this thing called? The TTT, transpupillary thermotherapy, which is a kind of laser, huge, uh, I think diode laser that burns a lot of, you know, bigger tumors. That could have a role for these tumors uh, because they're not coming too early, but I, I, I don't have any experience with it. Okay, uh, Dr. Kimani, 
You can, I'm seeing your hand is up, please. Uh, uh, th thank you, Dr. Washira and Dr. Mushai for that wonderful presentation. I had a similar case, but this was an older gentleman referred from Lyons. He was probably, I think he was about 58. And actually the, the melanoma was picked just on routine eye checkup. He had just gone to change his glasses and fortunately somebody looked at the fundus because he was also complaining of floaters. His vision was actually 6'6", six, six, fully corrected, but he had this huge mass. And I sent the fundus photos and the, uh, the biscan to one of my friends in LVPI, uh, an, ocular, an ocular oncologist there. And when she looked, she said, in spite of the good vision, it is better to enucleate. The patient was, would have been able to pay and go to India, but she just advised to be a nucleate. So it looks like for choroidal melanoma, the, the, even in view of good vision, so long as the lesion is too large, it looks like it's safer. Because uh, as you have seen, even as a, 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 I think as Dr. Mushai was talking about the gentleman who went to UK, they did brachytherapy, they did everything but eventually the eye still had to come out. So, I, and I think uh, this was an excellent decision to enucleate this young man. It was an excellent decision. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kiman. Um, I'm seeing we don't have any other questions on the chat. I don't know if I have left anyone out with a hand up. Uh, uh, Dr. Mashira, could I ask you to stop sharing your slide and put something up? Okay, sorry, continue Dr. Kalu. No, no, go ahead. I do not have any questions uh, pending or any comments, so you can go ahead, Dr. Yeah, so I mean, basically, these were the discussion points we were hoping would be discussed, and the conversation has taken its course. And I think we've covered each of these, such that, you know, choroidal melanomas in the African population uh, definitely do not neglect that as a differential uh, diagnosis. Uh, it is much less, we are talking 0.3 to 0.5% of melanomas, but uh, for that patient, it's 100%. And of course, in young patients, now a young African. I mean, I, th I think Bob Marley died from melanoma. It was diagnosed late. So young African patients now, it's even rarer uh, because you'll find young patients with melanoma under 20 years also form less than 1% of the you know, burden of melanoma. Um, and you know, in our case series, I looked at the youngest reported case for uveal melanoma was three. So you can imagine a three-year-old with a melanoma if he's African, it's the last thing on your mind. So keep a lookout for these um, kind of conditions. Um, I have you know, a lot more presentations on melanoma. I've seen quite a number of cases, uh, including cases where we've been able to take biopsies, transvitreal, transcleral, and they're quite interesting. And maybe we'll have some time to discuss those. Um, and then now, of course, Dr. Ashira has discussed on the treatment options and Dr. Kimani and Ashira have touched on the prognosis. So basically, these were the take hospital messages we wanted you know, people to take in terms of it's rare in Africans, but it does occur. And it can masquerade as other conditions. You've seen Dr. Kimani's patient just came in as a patient with refractive error and floaters looking for glasses. We've had our patient here who presented as a retinal detachment. We've had patients preventing with PVR. Um, it looks like, like a, as a granuloma. I had the other patient who presented as angle closure glaucoma, who was actually on treatment for it uh, because his angles were very shallow. But when we saw him, we realized it was kind of just in one particular quadrant and were able to pick it up early. I shared it with the referring physician and you know, we both followed up on the patient's treatment. Uh, we've had a patient also who presented with dense asteroid hyalosis. These are all masquerading syndromes because we know normally asteroid is not 
you know, it doesn't impair your vision much. And this patient had been on follow-up from before and we knew he had asteroid hyalosis. So when the patient now comes with much denser asteroid than before, we assume it's just gotten worse. And so it was an indication for vitrectomy because of very dense asteroid hyalosis now impairing the patient's vision. Um, and as we were about to begin the case, we realized something was not right. Did an ultrasound and realized it was a huge melanoma that was pushing the entire vitreous body forward. So all you could see on the fundoscopy was that condensed anterior vitreous, which now appeared very dense because of the asteroid. And with no view of the fundus, uh, you could not tell actually that there was a melanoma behind. That was a case that had been seen by Dr. Kibata as well. So a timely B-scan and referral to oculoplasty is essential and be aware of you know, positive tests that rule in other conditions, but not necessarily rule out um, tumors and melanoma in this case. So any further comments on the chat or any questions that people might want addressed? And no further comments, but perhaps uh, Dr. Washira has another, an addition to what you have given us as a tech hospital, but this time round it might be tech home. <laughs> <laughs> Anything, Dr. Washira? You're muted, we can't hear you. All right, uh, no, not really. I probably would just like to uh, highlight on the, the primacy of some sort of surgical intervention here, uh, basically because uh, chemotherapy is not effective. Uh, treatment for metastatic disease is, is very um, in, uh, ineffective, inconsequential really. So here, the earlier you one makes a decision to, to intervene, the better. And thank you all very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Gishuri's uh, uh, comment here, SPNI and uh, SNNOUT, if the says if the test has high specificity and a positive result rules in the disease, if the test is highly sensitive or high sensitivity, then a negative result rules out the disease. Uh, that I think is in, um, in relation to the question, should we uh, take the quantiferon TB gold uh, sensitivity or specificity um, question? that had been raised by Patrick and Dr. Kimani. Yeah, I saw Patrick's comment was quite interesting that all his patients are positive. Yeah. Uh, he probably just has a lot of TB in his region because I get quite a number of negative tests. Um, true, the specificity of cotiferon TB is higher than its sensitivity. Its sensitivity is like about 99% or more. So it is, it is better for ruling out, but its sensitivity is, you know, is something not so bad in the region of about 95. So it's, um, it's, it's, it can be used either way, but definitely has a higher specificity. So thank you for that comment, Dr. Gishui. Uh, and Patrick, I, I've gotten quite a number of your referrals for TB and uh, we, we see them and we treat them and they, and they do better on treatment. So the test results are not too bad. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mushai. Thank you, Dr. Washira. I'm seeing uh, some other comments on uh, great presentation. So yes, we have uh, really enjoyed your presentation and it is uh, uh, something to think about uh, even as we see other patients that don't seem to fit in a certain uh, presentation, the case presentation, so that um, we are able to diagnose early and see if we can save uh, the globe. Um, today we were being uh, sponsored by uh, Novartis. They have been able to help us make this possible. So I'm going to give them a five minute opportunity to give us a talk before we can come to the end of our presentation and CME session today. Um, Karibu. Thank you so much, 
Dr. Kadu and also Dr. Mushai, Dr. Washira for that uh, great presentation. So Dr. Kadu, allow me to share my screen. Uh, go ahead, please, Charity. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So for now, I'll take us through the use of management of, uh, use of Nevanac in the management of pain inflammation post cataract surgery, and uh, also safety, prophylactic, safety of prophylactic intracameral cefloxacin uh, in cataract surgery. So to start us off, uh, when it comes to Nevanac in treatment of pain and inflammation post cataract surgery, what Nevanac is, it's a topical NSAID with an active substance, Nepafenac. So it's approved for two indications, one being uh, management of prevention of and treatment of post-operative ocular pain and inflammation. And the second one is for prevention of cystoid macular edema on patients with diabetes. So it's a sterile yellow to light orange uh, suspension. It's also comfortable to instill since it has a pH of 7.4. So it doesn't sting and it enhances patient compliance. It is preserved with back 0.005%. Nevernac has a unique mode of action since it comes as a prodrug, but upon installation into the eye, the intraocular hydrolysis or enzymes converts it to the active form that is amphenac. Nepafenac, which is in active form and the active form because not all nepafenac is converted at the same time, there is a continuous conversion of nepafenac into amphenac, which is the active form. Uh, whenever there is a tendency of pain or inflammation, nepafenac gets converted. So both nepafenac and amphenac inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes that are responsible for prostaglandin production. Also, both nepafenac and amphenac block the inflammation-mediated breakdown of the blood retinal barrier that contributes to plasma extravasation and edema. Nevernac has a novel product structure. What do I mean by a novel product structure? First, it optimizes activation. That is upon ocular dosing. Nepafenac is metabolized by the uh, intraocular hydrolysis to amphenac, the active form. It has a target specific efficacy. Nepafenac is converted into amphenac for optimal efficacy, either in the iris, ciliary body, choroid, retina, and also to cornea. It minimizes toxicity. Ocular service complications associated with conventional NSA therapies may be minimized because the drug rapidly distributes into both anterior and posterior segments. Also, Nevernac has been approved for prevention of cystoid macular edema. As you can see from that uh, study, this was a study that was done uh, comparing use of steroids and also NSAIDs, maybe for diabetic patients. And you find that from that study, 86% of those patients experience less risk of developing CME as compared to 23.6% of those patients who were put on steroids. Uh, dosage for Nevernac, since it is approved for two indications, so first, for non-diabetic patients, you give Nevernac one drop three times a day, uh, beginning from a day before surgery, on the day of surgery, and two weeks after surgery for non-diabetic patients. And an additional uh, drop can be given 30 to 120 minutes prior to surgery. For diabetic patients, you give one drop in the affected eye or eyes, three times daily, beginning from a day before surgery, on the day of surgery, and 60 days after surgery. Also, an additional drop can be given 30 to 120 minutes prior to surgery. So that's for Nevernac. 
I'll check the questions at the end of the presentations. And uh, safety use of uh, prophylactic intracameral moxifloxacin in cataract surgery. So we have one of our brand uh, for which is Vigamox, our moxifloxacin 0.5%. It's indicated for treatment of purulent bacterial conjunctivitis caused by moxifloxacin susceptible strains. Its presentation is that uh, Vigamox, which is a fourth generation fluoroquinolone, its preservative, it's self-preserved. It doesn't have back or any other preservative. For pediatric use, it's been approved for all ages, including newborns. It has a pH of 6.8, that is near neutral pH, enhancing that comfortability when it comes to installation. Dosage form, it comes in a solution, so it has a fast uh, um, mechanism of action. It's approved for both pre-operative and also post-operative uh, prophylaxis. It's also approved for bacterial keratitis or corneal ulcers. It's also approved for bacterial conjunctivitis. It has a high penetration power as compared to other fluoroquinolones. It has a broad spectrum coverage against both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, as you can see from that uh, table. Also against all micro anaerobic microorganisms and other organisms. So as compared to other fluoroquinolones, especially gatifloxacin, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, and ofloxacin, uh, Vigamox has a broad spectrum coverage and also it's high penetration. So it, when it comes to safety of prophylactic intracameral moxifloxacin in cataract surgery, we have a study that is Steven uh, Lane study with Robert, Samuel, and also Shalin. So this was just a study to evaluate posterior and anterior segment safety of an intracameral injection of moxifloxacin 0.5 of thalmic solution as prophylaxis for endophthalmitis in patients having cataract surgery. Uh, methods that were used in this study, this prospective randomized combined center open lipo trial, 57 eyes of 47 patients were treated with intracameral moxifloxacin or an equal volume of balanced salt solution at the conclusion of cataract surgery with intraocular lens implant implantation. Safety parameters, including visual acuity, intraocular pressure, endothelial cell counts, corneal parchymetry, corneal clarity, and edema. Nanterior chamber cells and flare were evaluated preoperatively and also for three months postoperatively. And from this study, the results were optical coherence tomography results showed no statistical significant difference between the two treatment groups preoperatively and also at three months after operation. There were also no statistically significant differences between the two treatment groups in all other parameters preoperatively or at day one, two to four weeks also, or at three months. No study related adverse events occurred during this study. And uh, from, the, uh, from the results, it was concluded that there was no increased safety risk associated with uh, 250 micro, uh, micrograms of intracameral injection of moxifloxacin, which appears to be safe in prophylaxis of endophthalmitis after cataract surgery. Vigamox being a fourth generation uh, agent, supplied as a sterile isotonic solution with a pH of near 6.8, osmolality of 290, making it compatible with intraocular tissues. Moxifloxacin is also self-preserved, containing no benzalkonium uh, chloride or other preservatives known to have toxic effects on corneal epithelium. Uh, from the summary of the study, so we find that uh, Vigamox has a better penetration. It achieves both superior ocular concentration than gatifloxacin. It has a biphasic molecule 
that's soluble in both lipid and aqueous solutions. It has a better potency, meaning more potent than gatifloxacin against gram positive, and it has a broad spectrum of coverage against gram, both gram negative and positive. Better comfort since it has a pH of 6.8, so it enhances that patient compliance. It's self-preserved, doesn't have back related to ocular side effects. Also, it's comfortable. It has a convenient dosing of uh, TID. So you give one drop three times a day for one week. So with the use of uh, safety, use of Vigamox in prophylaxis to uh, cataract surgery. So you can get that all the benefits uh, your patients can get it from Vigamox. So thank you so much. And uh, don't allow endophthalmitis ruin your good surgery. Thank you so much. And I'll take any question. Dr. Kadu. Thank you, uh, Charity. I'm seeing no questions. Perhaps uh, you could tell us the retail price of the Vigamox, even as you are finishing your presentation and stop sharing. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Kadu. Uh, retail um, price, Kalu story. Uh, retail price for Vigamox, it's 2000. And maybe for other chemists, it can go up to 2500. Okay, thank you, Charity. I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, so I think, uh, thank you for your uh, pre presence today. Thank you, Charity, for enabling us, uh, for, for helping us with the, the support for this CME. Thank you, Dr. Washira. Thank you, Dr. Mushai, for a wonderful presentation and discussion. Um, thank you, everyone, for making time to be present with us. Um, I, we have come to the end of our CME session today. Um, the next session will be in the next two weeks. Uh, the presenter and the topic will be uh, communicated in due course on our uh, various uh, social media groups. Um, there is a, before I, I send us away, so Dr. Inoti is asking, is it a vial for single use or a bottle for multiple dose use charity? I don't know if that is for the Nepefanac or the Vigamox. Okay, uh, either if it's for Nepefanac or Vigamox, it's a bottle for multiple use. Okay. Uh, that includes the one that is used intracameral. Yes. Okay. I hope, uh, Dr. Inoti, you've noted that. So thank you once again, and I wish you all a pleasant evening. Let's uh, plan to meet again in the next two weeks. Um, you're free to leave. Have a good night. Have a good night, everyone.